Janice, um, Janice Stegney is going to be our presenter today. She's going to talk about weed management practices for hay and pasture. Um, Janice Stegney's worked as Cornell Cooperative Extension Educator for 30 years. She's an agronomist with an MPS in plant protection and a BS in agronomy, both from Cornell University. She's a team leader and field crop specialist for the South Central New York Dairy and Field Crops team. The regional team serves six counties, Rome, Shimong, Portland, Onondaga, Tompkins, and Tioga counties. Her work addresses management and production issues that farmers face in crop production and environmental stewardship. Currently, her educational efforts are focused in the following areas, integrated crop management, environmental stewardship, forage quality by providing resources, workshops, and applied research. Throughout her tenure with CCE, she has collaborated on applied research projects with Cornell University faculty. So I'm going to turn it over to Janice Degney and she'll share her um, <clears throat> knowledge on weed management practices for hay and pasture. Go ahead, Janice. Thanks, Mike. So as Mike said, um, that's my task today. It's a big field. I'll be talking about um, hay fields from clear alfalfa to mixed stands to pastures. And um, I have to thank Jeff for asking folks, what did, did they see as some of their more uh, pernicious problem weeds? And I tried to address as many of those listed weeds as possible. Okay, so I'm not advancing. <laughs> So number one, to your best defense against weeds is to use all the best practices for getting a new seeding off to a strong start, beginning with variety selection and timely planning. Today we have varieties that can bring all kinds of characteristics like potato leaf hopper resistance. You can have good quality with low lignin varieties or conventional varieties with some meadow fescue. You wanna make sure you're including disease resistance in your selection. Um, <clears throat> all the things, you wanna put all the things in place to get that stand off to a very strong start. So with timely planting, we wanna plant our alfalfa as early as our fields are ready in the spring because alfalfa will germinate as, at a lower temperature than our typical broadleaf weeds. And so it can get a jump start and be a little bit more competitive. As we delay planting, and especially like into late May and early June, we tend to be getting drier and the weeds can really have a huge advantage over the alfalfa. Soil prep is so important. We have recommended for years that you call to pack before you seed and then call to pack again after seeding to make sure you're getting good uh, seed to soil contact. And think about, you know, pick your species for the, for the field condition. So if you've got a wetter soil, maybe you want to go with a weed canary grass. And a lot of folks like to have an area where they can do some manure spreading in the summertime. So you want to pick a grass that's going to, re <clears throat> going to give you yield back for that extra nutrient. And good grasses for that are weed canary, orchard, or tall fescue. Let's see. This picture here is uh, it's from a, a stand that is showing, first of all, some weeds, some ragweed here. And then we have this purpling on the back of the alfalfa leaves. That's an indication of boron deficiency. And then here, I hope you guys can see my pointer. We have some potato leaf hopper damage. So there's a lot, go whoops, sorry about that. There's a lot going on in that slide. Even the, <clears throat> well, we have some nut sedge over here and we have some broadleaf plantain. But I think most importantly here is the fact that um, we're seeing that boron deficiency, which is really stressing the alfalfa in addition to the other issues in the slide. So soil testing, you know, uh, like once in three years in your rotation. So you're aware of fertility and liming needs before you head out to the field to seed. In this picture, this was taken from a cooler, dry spring. And you can see even the lamb's quarters in this picture 
is really not doing that well it's stressed. And then we see some nut sedge, we see some annual grasses. And this, the stand itself in the field was very irregular. So you have this patch here in the box that looks pretty decent. We've got some small lambs quarters coming in here. Uh, we've got a little bit of nut sedge breaking through, but overall uh, the germination is pretty good. So as far as nut sedge, it's a weed that's easier controlled earlier in the rotation, like in the corn portion of the rotation with some permit or something like that. <clears throat> I will talk about later that you can use Eptam pre-plant that has to be incorporated. That's one of our older chemicals. It's reliable with nut sedge, but it has to be done before seeding. And then over in the lower corner here on the right, we see that there's quite a bit of trash on the soil. Maybe we've had some rainfall and a little bit of erosion from the soil. We see some alfalfa here that's germinating. That's pretty stressed looking. It doesn't look vigorous at all. And then we have some healthy lambs quarters. So this is an example of uh, maybe not great seed bed prep and not the best conditions to get in that alfalfa off to a strong start. So just as a guideline, uh, over 90% of the weed control in a healthy forage crops comes from the competition provided by the forage itself. That's why I'm saying it's really important to get all those building blocks in place at the time of seeding. Um, <clears throat> however, to maintain a relatively weed free forage, proper fertilization is important, cutting management is important, insect control and disease resistant varieties will all contribute to that strong stand. So your personal weed tolerance is gonna to come into your weed control decisions. So I've put a variety of pictures here. If we go to the far right where we have quite a bit of mature dandelion, this might be a field that uh, is in its last year of production and you could treat it with herbicide, but you're really not gonna get the bang for your dollar because um, once you remove that dandelion, you're basically gonna have blank spots in your stand. I mean, this is the little picture here, just off to the right. You know, that's kind of um, maybe an ideal stand. It's beautiful, it's very full, the color's great, it's growing vigorously. Uh, to the left of that, we see some, uh, what looks like might be a mature dandelion. Maybe that's a tolerable level and you're not gonna track up your field and treat for that amount of weed. So that's one of the key points of the decision. How many, how much weeds in your seeding or established stands you can actually tolerate. So controlling weeds in the established stands is normally of greatest benefit in the first cutting and their impact in later cuttings is uh, much less impactful. <clears throat> a practice that we've used in the past and I feel like has maybe fallen out of a favor a little bit more recently is using nurse crops. Oats was commonly seeded with our alfalfa. The idea of the nurse crop is that it, they get off the, to a quick start, they provide shading, to reduce germination of some of our broadleaf weeds. And then if we do get germination of the weeds, because their leaves are already established, the oat leaves or the oats and peas, it causes them to be a weaker plant. They grow more elongated and they're less competitive with the crops. So common nurse crops that have been used, oats, clear oats, oats and peas, that was really popular for a while. Um, and then red clover works really nice with reed canary grass because reed canary gets off to such a slow start. It takes a long, uh, quite a long time to get a good stand establishment. And their uh, red, red clover kind of protects the reed canary grass and outcompetes other weeds that might be out in the field. So the advantages of the nurse crop is not only to suppress the weeds, but potentially offer you increased yield and quality in that first cutting. But if you've ever grown oats and peas, you may have had a year where they grew so aggressively and vigorous that they lodged and then they were hard to mow and then they were hard to dry in the windrow. So you kind of got this slimy mat of yuck. So you may not have reached the quality that you had hoped for originally. And of course, these options are always good when forage inventory is tight to boost that first cutting yield. 
So that's a non-chemical method of trying to keep your broadleaf weeds at bay in a new seeding. So as I've talked, managing weeds and forages begins long before we start the crop. And certain types of weeds are much bigger problem than others. So when we start to talk about our perennial broadleaves and grasses, such as dandelion, curly dock, Canada thistle, and quack grass, they're much easier to manage in, the, in a prior crop. Quack grass really, I don't see that as a problem in alfalfa anymore because we're using Roundup in other parts of the rotation in the uh, quack grass has kind of just become a non-issue. And it's a grass. It has the same uh, basically nutritional qualities as some of our other cool season grasses. So it's not the worst weed to have in a mixed stand. The biennial weeds can be challenging such as bull thistle, wild carrot and burdock because by the time we're aware of them, it's kind of too late to treat. So these are two year weeds the first year they grow close to the ground, they're a little more difficult to recognize and see. Once they flower, if you go in and treat, we call that a revenge spray because they're already at the end of their life cycle and they're not gonna be a problem. It's the seed they sowed that's gonna germinate in the next year. That's gonna be the plant that you wanna go after. Sometimes we don't have control over how much our stands thin during the winter. This is a the picture to the left shows some very severe frost heaving um, and other things can damage our, our crowns during the winter. We can actually have freezing in addition to the, um, uh, what we see here in this picture. What we really like to see in the spring is a picture to the right where we have a good density of crowns and good vigorous growth and really not many visible weeds. So I just wanna take a moment and um, talk about um, keeping our stands as strong as we can with our, with our harvest management. So some things to think about before treating with the herbicide, thin or irregular stands will not thicken once weeds are removed. And now if you have an alfalfa stand with grass, the grass could be encouraged with uh, either manure applications or nitrogen fertilizer so that those areas fill in with you know, harvestable crops. And be sure that, our, that we have enough of the desirable species, either the the legume or the grass to fill in those gaps. So there's really two ways to evaluate this. We can go out and, and count stems per square foot, or we can count crowns. It's much easier to count crowns. And as you can see in the chart to the right, <clears throat> in the first year, we want a lot of crowns per square foot, 25 to 30. By the second year, we're gonna have competition within the plants and some winter kill and the crowns themselves are getting larger and more productive. So we can have between 10 and 15 crowns and we'll still have a good stand. And when we get into three years, five or six crowns will provide healthy crowns will provide adequate yield. So I wanna just step back and talk a little bit about our harvest management practices because <clears throat> what I see is as we target high quality forage and we use an aggressive harvest strategy, starting with first cutting at mid to late bud and then followed by harvest about every 28 days, I think that repeatedly with weather challenges and things like that, we really uh, impact our, the stand of our uh, how long our stand is productive. And as we kind of weaken some of those crowns and they disappear, then we get the infiltration of some of the biennial weeds that, or winter annual weeds that we really don't like to see in the stand. It's also very important for everyone to evaluate their fall harvest management practices and to not overstress the crowns and their ability to overwinter. So that's what I wanna talk a little bit about in this slide in the chart to the left where we have root carbohydrates. 
we see that when the crop starts to grow, the plant is drawing on root reserves to send up those new leaves and uh, you know, really put the crop out there. And when it's flowering, that's at the peak photosynthesis point. The most sugars are going back down into the crowns to create the food stores for the next cutting. But we tend to want to cut before bloom to get that high quality somewhere in the mid to, mid to maybe early bud stage. Because we're trying to you know, find the sweet spot between yield and quality. So in this picture, you can see once we pass uh, flower, our digestibility starts to drop off. So just in case you haven't been out looking at the alfalfa in the field recently, we'll just review quickly. This is a plant in early bud. It's a little difficult to see the buds here, but sometimes at this stage, you can feel them. There's kind of like a hard ball at the very top of the, the uh, stem. And then within a week, maybe a week and a half, it'll move into the mid bud stage. And again, it's not, this picture is not the clearest, but I think there's a mid bud there, but they're more obvious. You shouldn't have to feel them for, it, for them any longer. And then at late bud, they're very obvious. They're sticking out from the stem. Now, as the plant moves from early to mid to late bud, you'll also see buds further down the stems. So um, the remainder of the root carbohydrate reserves used to support early vegetative growth have not been re fully replenished at the mid bud stage. High quality, for high quality, the remainder of the cutting should be taken at mid bud. So it's kind of hard to coordinate bud stage with a timed interval. And um, that's one of the reasons why you're gonna wanna be a little more cautious about that fall harvest. So take later cuttings on a time interval and leave one interval of at least 35 days to let those uh, roots get re rebuilt with uh, carbohydrates. Again, you know, our alfalfa varieties today are really good, lots of good disease resistance has, um, they, can, they can withstand some of these stresses that maybe older varieties couldn't. And they've also been selected for rapid regrowth, which increases their yield potential. But one of the downsides of this, this faster regrowth is a result of decreased production of auxin, which is a plant hormone, um, which allows earlier regrowth from the crown buds. So harvesting during the flower bud stage provides relatively high forage quality, but continuously harvesting at this stage will result in low root carbohydrate reserves and standard decline. So basically, we're gonna wa want that 35 day rest period or even some signs of flower in the field in one of our later cuttings, I'd say ideal maybe in third cutting <clears throat> to allow those um, roots to get replenished with their carbohydrate reserves. So in this graph, we it shows us that the forage quality of alfalfa does not change as rapidly in later cuttings as in earlier cuttings. So if we look here, this is the top graph is yield, the bottom graph is a relative feed value with the cutting intervals across the x axis here. So in first cutting, the later we cut, the greater the increase in our yield. This is true for first, second, and third pretty much. But our feed value goes down. So we gain more yield, but we lose quality, which is you know, what I said earlier, we're all trying to find that sweet spot where we can optimize yield and quality together. But if we look at the fourth cutting, we see that yield doesn't tend to increase in that upward pattern with more time. If we think about it, if we're looking at like say September, it's already cooler, the days are shorter and uh, it just doesn't exhibit the same growth pattern of constantly increasing on a daily basis. So here we can stretch our cutting 
10 days and we don't see a drop in feed value. Even in the third cutting, we can stretch our, our cutting out over, give it an extra five, seven, 10 days. And we're not seeing that rapid decline in feed value that we, we see in the, sorry, my mouse is super sensitive, in maybe the first cutting or the second cutting. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's worth considering leaving that longer uh, interval between cuts, maybe for third cutting, and maybe not even going after that really late cutting in the fall until after the killing frost. <clears throat> so kind of um, as a summary, management that supports the strong alfalfa stand or the best uh, stand length is the cutting height, cut at least two inches above the soil surface for alfalfa, three to four inches if grass is mixed within the alfalfa. So that will help preserve some of those buds at the base of the plant that'll produce the next stems for the next cutting. And that will help you maximize your stem density. Short cutting intervals will kind of weaken those buds at the base of the stem, reduce them. And then something that's out of our control, but moisture stress immediately after cutting. So I would say drought stress will reduce the number of crown and auxiliary buds and therefore reduce stem density and yield. And a later ro uh, rain in the season really won't make up for that, unfortunately. Okay, so going back to uh, thinking about weed control, weeds that emerge with the crop are generally the most impactful. And ideally we'd maintain the forage relatively weed free for the first 60 days. So that's basically our time from seeding to first harvest. But then the weeds that emerge after that are not gonna have that much uh, influence on the year's forage yield. So we've all seen new seedings where for whatever reason, we couldn't get out there and apply a herbicide to treat. And we see lambs quarters, we see uh, pig weeds, we see mustards, there's all kinds of annual weeds that maybe are on par with the alfalfa or, or maybe a little bit ahead. And often we can cut that at our 60 day mark that, you know, our first cutting, and we don't see, the, the stand is strong enough that we don't see those weeds in future cuttings. So maybe our quality is impacted a little because we have you know, some mustard or ragweed in there that's a little bit less desirable in our feed, but we haven't necessarily hurt the stand. Um, <clears throat> winter annual weed competition in the early spring is, uh, definitely an issue for our established stands. And we often see chickweed or purple dead nettle, henbit and pepperweed in the, in the spring, maybe in the second year, you see that in the spring. Or if we have a summer seeded uh, seeding, we'll often see these winter annuals in the next uh, spring. And broadleaf weeds are generally more competitive against grassy weeds in an alfalfa stand. Makes sense. Uh, grassy weeds are, uh, have less photosynthetic area. So I'm gonna move into kind of some recipes for control and I wanna present some resources that are available to help you make those decisions. One is the Cornell Guide for Integrated Field Crop Management. The best way to access this is through the Cornell store. It's a little bit pricey, I would say that um, you don't necessarily need to buy a new one every year, but it's an excellent resource. And in addition to herbicide recommendations for hay crop and pasture, they're also there for all our other uh, field crops along with fertility guides and uh, you know, a lot of agronomic information. Two other guides that I found very useful is the Penn State Agronomy Guide. Uh, these, these two guides have a little bit lower price point. So the online version for Penn State is $15. If you get the book, it's $45. But um, 
If you go online, you could probably download um, an older issue. And then there's this guide for Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, which is excellent. There's excellent tables in all three of these guides. <clears throat> and that, that's available to order online. Uh, the Ohio Weed Control Guide is currently out of stock though. So again, maybe you could download last year's version. One thing about using guides from, not from New York State is they may have pesticide recommendations that are not uh, registered in New York State. So you just wanna be aware of that. And if you wanna double check, you can go to the NICEPAD app at the DEC portal to check any chemicals you're not sure about. If they don't show up in the database, that means they're not labeled in New York State. So what's really important when you are getting ready to apply a herbicide is that um, you're following the label and the label will tell you what size is ideal for the weed control, but also what size the alfalfa needs to be so that the alfalfa isn't damaged. So I wanna look at that here. So in this picture, you can see an emerging alfalfa seed in the cotyledon stage. And then we see the first true leaf come out. We call that a unifoliate leaf because it's just one leaflet. And the next leaves all come out pretty much with, with three leaflets. We call that a trifoliate. Sometimes we'll have four leaflets, but we're looking for these trifoliate leaves because many labels will say that we need to not to apply the herbicide before three trifoliates are out or five trifoliates. So if we look at this plant, we have the you, we have the cotyledons, we have the first unifoliate, we have the first trifoliate, and then we have an immature trifoliate that's about to expand here. So this would be one trifoliate. In this picture, we see we have two trifoliates exposed, the third one here on its way. But if we were going to spray, we would want the majority of the field to be beyond the stage. You might have a two trifoliate here and there, but you want that third trifoliate out if that's what the label says. And then down in this picture, we actually have one, two, three, four, five trifoliates out. And some of the labels ask for five trifoliates. So you need to go out and evaluate the field and take you know, a good, uh, assessment of the majority of the what stage the field's in because the field could actually you could have hills and lower spots and they it might not be exactly even growth and you don't want to be uh, killing some of the plants that aren't ready for the for the herbicide. Uh, one option for some of those early spring biennials is to do a dormant spray. So things like dandelion, the dead nettle, chickweed. Velpar was uh, frequently used in the past, or not frequently, but one of the more popular dormant options. It, if the alfalfa is not dormant, it's gonna hurt the alfalfa. So you wanna make sure the alfalfa hasn't broken bud and started to grow. There are also some other contact herbicides that I'll talk about in a minute. Okay. So I'm gonna go through recommendations. I'm gonna start with clear alfalfa. So that's alfalfa, no grass and no small grain. Um, I'm gonna start with nut sedge is a problem. And like I mentioned earlier, you can use Eptan. It's pre-plant only. It has to be applied to a dry soil surface and some springs we don't really have that. And uh, incorporated immediately. Discs, light, a light disking works better than drags. It gives more even. Uh, distribution of the Eptam and better coverage. It will not control wild radish, mustard, or ragweed. If we're looking at annual grasses and broadleaf weeds in a clear alfalfa stand, we have the options of pursuit or raptor. So again, now this is saying apply in the second trifoliate stage, so a little bit earlier. And um, when weeds are one to three inches tall. So those are pretty small weeds. We wanna use surfactants, crop oil concentrate or non-ionic surfactant and add some liquid uh, nitrogen to heat up the spray. 
if ragweed or lamb's quarters are included in the weeds in the field, you're gonna to wanna to add a little butyrac to control them. Another option uh, is baylan, which you, again has to be applied pre-plant and incorporated. So I really don't um, see that used very often. But on any product, you wanna make sure that you're following the directions for adjuvants in the mix. Okay, so uh, this is looking at annual grasses and annual broadleaf weeds. So for grasses, if we have thick annual grasses coming into our pure alfalfa seeding, we can go in with post or select max. And again, you know, in the tables, there's some general recommendations and things to watch out for, but you really should read through the label to make sure you're getting all the proper recommendations, the amount of uh, volume of water and things like that. And then the other thing with hay crop and pasture we have to be aware of is that many of the herbicides do have grazing or harvest restrictions. So you have to factor that into the time of application and what your plans are for harvest or uh, grazing down the road. So for our annual broadleaf weeds, we have our old, what is called bromoxanil now, was buctril in the past, and butyrac. These were our go-to before the uh, BASF products were available. These were like the standard treatments. And the thing about bromoxanil, the cautionary thing, is that it can't be applied when temperatures are gonna exceed 70 degrees and they can't exceed 70 degrees for up to three days following the application. When I was uh, in, <laughs> early in my career as a field scout, I watched a field die. It actually got cooked because uh, it got treated with buckchill. And we probably went up like into 80 degrees or something. We had some high temperatures and the alfalfa just disappeared from the field as well as the weeds. But that was uh, definitely a learning experience for me. Uh, Butyrac doesn't have the um, temperature restriction and can also be effective, um, but you wanna get it on those smaller weeds. And it will not control wild radish. So radish and mustard can, can be difficult to distinguish. There's uh, some slight differences in the leaf. Uh, formation. I guess that's the way you have to distinguish it if you don't know what's out there. If it doesn't die off, you know it was radish and not mustard. Uh, another option in for Roundup Ready alfalfa only when it's a clear stand is to use Roundup to clean up those weeds. So again, there's a height here, five trifoliate leaves before you uh, apply the Roundup to the new seeding. And then even with that, you can lose up to 10% of the seedings, seedlings because um, of alfalfa's genetic diversity and the fact that not every single seed in that bag will have the Roundup Ready gene in it. So these I would say are two of our most common weeds we see in the spring in established alfalfa, henbit, chickweed, uh, purple dead nettle on the left, henbit on the right, and then the chickweeds. And uh, chickweed, they can all be fairly aggressive and they can be on par with the alfalfa or actually like a little more aggressive than the alfalfa. So they can, um, they can be troublesome, but timing Sometimes timing for application is difficult. Uh, <clears throat> so just some uh, stats on how damaging chickweed can be. Um, there have been studies where reduced forage stand by more than 30%. And the problem is it comes in in the fall and then gets an early start in the spring. Again, I remember checking a new seeding one spring that had a chickweed infestation where you, you had to part 
the chickweed to find the alfalfa seedlings. But by the time we got out there to check this, it was too late to apply the herbicide for the field. So the farmer just took, took the chickweed off in the first cutting. And I'm telling you, you couldn't see the alfalfa under that chickweed, but the, when that second cutting regrowth started, it was fine. It was a beautiful stand. So it was a good stand where all the steps had been taken to start a strong stand. And I think that's what helped it weather that chickweed infestation. And since it's a winter annual, once you cut it out, as long as it hasn't set seed, it's done. <clears throat> um, so some more recommendations for established alfalfa. For the chickweed, henbit, yellow racket, and other broadleaf seeds, you can go in with four to six ounces of pursuit. You can apply that in the fall or spring to dormant or semi-dormant or alfalfa or between cuttings. So it would have to be before the regrowth starts when, uh, between cuttings because you don't want to damage uh, your alfalfa. And if it's a mixed stand, you don't want to dam uh, damage your cool season grasses. Another option is to go in with Gramoxone as a dormant spray. So that's a contact herbicide that um, is non-selective. So it's gonna kill any of the broadleaves out there or any grasses. Um, and then again, if you have Roundup Ready Alfalfa, you could go in with a Roundup application. Okay, so moving into legume seedings that do have a small grain companion crop, your options are gonna be a little more limited. So if there's quack grass, what this recommendation is saying is to make sure you clean that quack grass up the year before seeding. So if you plow the field in the summertime, you will not be able to apply Roundup because you won't have the growth you need to get it taken up by the grass. Um, if you do apply Roundup to establish quack grass, you have to wait three days before tilling because you want that Roundup to move down into the roots and kill the plant. Um, and again, there's gonna be a grazing and harvest restriction with that application. For annual broadleaf leaves, we're back to our bromoxanil option, one point uh, for clear alfalfa, but with a small, small grain. Uh, with a minimum of four trifoliate leaves, smaller weeds, four leaf stage or two inches in height, whichever comes first, or ap applied to rosettes that are one inch in diameter, which is pretty tiny. That's like a quarter, like the size of a quarter. And again, you've got that concern about higher temperatures and then a grazing restriction. So if you have a small grain with red clover, you can use MCP amine 4, MCPA, but you want the small grain to be kind of sheltering the red clover when you do that application so you don't burn the clover. And then I just threw this in. Um, if you're growing a summer grass, either to boost your pasture or for additional yield, you're pretty limited in what you can do for weed control. There's nothing for nothing available for nut sedge and annual grasses. As far as broadleaf weeds, uh, our old friend atrazine is our option. And uh, we wanna apply after the sorghum so it is completely emerged and weeds are less than one and a half inches tall and it shouldn't be used with straight Sudan grass. Again, there's a grazing restriction do not graze or feed forage from treated areas for 20, 21 days following application. So if you're chopping this or making baleage and it goes into storage for several months, you're gonna meet that 21 day uh, uh, feeding restriction. So now we're gonna talk about uh, no-till burn down. And basically these are chemicals that are non-selective, which means they'll kill whatever they 
they hit and their contact are translocated. So quackgrass treated with Roundup, that's translocated, Roundup or any of the generic glyphosate products. Um, so the advantage of that is the herbicide is going to move into the plant and kill the root so that the plant can't reproduce. If we use germoxone as a burn down, that's a contact. So uh, something like it isn't, it isn't recommended here for quackgrass, but on a biennial or perennial weed, it's, it, it may not, it'll burn it back, but it may not control it from regrowing. I'm going to provide this presentation to Jeff to send to you after today so that uh, you will have these tables for reference if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> again, more no-till forage. If we have annual broadleaf weeds coming in to the seeding, we're back to our butyrac and bromoxanil uh, choices. And I, and I put a note here that timing, timing, timing was important because we want to get, we need to have our crop at the right size, big enough to tolerate the herbicides, but our weeds not too big to control. And sometimes that's really hard to, uh, to meet in a, in a growing season, depending on what's going on. Uh, just a quick note on Paraquat, if you're going to use that chemical, there is a training required. You can take it online. Um, what I would do is just Google Paracot training to get to the locations where you can do that training or contact. If you can't, if you can't find it and you need it, contact your local extension field crop specialist to help you find it. Okay, moving on to some of our kind of difficult perennial weeds that have been expanding across the landscape in the recent past. Spotted nap weed is really one of the worst. It's very uh, invasive, I would say. And it seems to have spread in areas where maybe the crop production has dropped off a bit. It's not as regular or competitive as it used to be. In the fields, maybe there's hay fields there that are mowed by beef farmers, so they're just mowed once or twice a year. And this, this uh, weed really has a chance to spread. Typically, I would say in our area, we're seeing either Russian knapweed or the spotted knapweed. Okay, so knapweed species are difficult to control and an integrated strategy is definitely necessary. And it's gonna take more than a single application or a single strategy to control this weed over time because you're just going to have to keep at it. Um, so if it's a large heavily infested area where you're really going to need to reseed anyway because the nap weed has drowned out any beneficial species for harvest, you're going to want to plow the field and reseed. The nap weed, you can plow it and then let it regrow and then hit it with the herbicide to weaken it. So if you do that, say midsummer, you could still have time to get a, possibly get a, a late August seeding in. We seed in the late fall or the next spring with a variety of adaptable perennial native species. So, you know, either clovers, grasses, whatever you wanna get out there. Um, but keep an eye on the stand to see if you're getting new seedlings coming in. You're going to want to fertilize the crop that you're trying to get to grow to be able to outcompete this weed. So in terms of spraying strategies, again, it's not a single spray. You could spray and graze. Um, treat, treat the infestation with selective herbicides and then maybe you know, graze it aggressively after the restriction period is up to uh, keep that plant from coming back in a strong way. 
And again, just keep an eye out for new seedings and maybe even spot treat them. You can mow to weaken the plant if you mow it when it's in the bud or bloom stage. Again, it's gonna force it to draw on its root reserves. And then you can come back and treat it with a herbicide when it's in a weakened condition. When a lot, for a lot of these um, biennial and perennial weeds, we're gonna recommend spraying at flower stage in the fall, which is effective because you've drawn down the root reserves, but also because winter's coming and winter will maybe take out any plants that the herbicide didn't take out. So <clears throat> the main message with knapweed is get the right recipe, keep an eye out there and plan on using methods more than once, whether it's mow and spray, spray and spray, till and spray. So here's a, a recipe. And I know this is the recipe because I got it from Mike Hunter. So um, unfortunately, what I didn't know is Cimarron has been taken off the market. So the only option on this slide is the Cimarron Plus. So it's 0.625 ounces of Cimarron Plus plus some dicamba, banvilla clarity, and then eight ounces of dicamba banvil with 16 ounces of 2,4-D ester. <clears throat> and it's important to use the ester formu formulation because it's gonna be a little bit hotter and it's gonna move into the plant a little bit better. A lot of times we'll say don't use the ester formulation because it's more volatile and we don't want it to drift off to another field. So keep that in mind. You don't wanna have a, a grape farm right next door to you when you're spraying 2,4-D ester. But uh, this is what the recommendation is to, to try and get the weed under control. And then you're gonna to wanna to add your adjuvant, your NIS. Another weed we tend to see in maybe older fields that are grass-based, that um, have been sort of mined with uh, hay harvest year after year after year, is smooth and catchweed bed straw. When we see bed straw on a stand, we can pretty much assume that the grass is getting run out. There is a very effective herbicide available that's crossbow. It is a little bit pricey, but it does take out the bed straw, which gives you a chance uh, if you use, you know, if you're willing to go in and fertilize the grass that's there to rebuild it and make it competitive, you can kind of, you know, save the stand without having to till, rotate, and reseed. But there has to be enough healthy grass left in that stand to make it worthwhile to go that route. So it's simply two quarts of crossbow. Like I said, it's very effective. There are harvest restrictions that you need to be aware of. So with some of these weeds, we might be in a state where we really need to think about renovation. And maybe this is on uh, hay, the hay ground that you were offered to farm for free and people have been haying it year after year and, and nobody's putting any fertility back into it. Or maybe it's new ground that you picked up that's been abandoned and uh, can be built into a good productive field. So <clears throat> as these fields you know, decline, are neglected, are mined, we're gonna see the perennial weeds come in and then we're gonna see woody species come in. So we're gonna be basically in the early stages of succession. Goldenrod is one of these weeds that we see that's like an indicator of this whole decline of stands or abandonment and then reclaiming. Golden rod, rod is a weak competitor. So if you uh, mow it and fertilize, if there are grasses in there underneath the golden rod that could make a decent hay stand, you can mow it and fertilize and eventually you'll, you'll drive that golden rod out. It's also very susceptible to plowing. So people say, well, should I spray it? Well, if you're gonna plow, you don't really need to. You can plow it and then uh, reseed and the goldenrod is unlikely to come back because the other, the new species will outcompete it. 
Okay, moving on to pasture weeds. We've got a whole large assortment with different growth cycles. We have winter annuals, the mustards and chickweed. We have summer annuals, we have biennials. So with winter annuals, um, you can mow F chickweed doesn't bolt, but anything that sh shoots up a flower stock is bolted. You could mow those and they're gonna be done and hopefully you've eliminated them before they've been able to set seed. And then you can mow them early in the season and then apply in a herbicide later in the season as we're heading into fall so that they won't be back the following year. Um, <clears throat> Summer annuals are pigweeds, lambs quarters, common ragweed, all those common weeds we see. Um, as long as we're not overgrazing our pasture, we really aren't likely to see them maybe in a seeding year. And again, you could go in and clip and then send the animals in to, to graze. You can clip them a little bit later after they've set it. They're in the flower stage, but before they've set seed. Or you can use one of the herbicide options that earlier in the summer when the weeds are small, when, the, when you're just establishing the new pasture field. Biennials can be a little more challenging. Again, I, like I mentioned earlier, if, you're, if they're in flower, you've already missed the control stage. They're on their way out. So you could mow them and hopefully prevent seed production at that point. If it's just a small area and they're just getting started, you could dig them, remove them by hand or spot spray with something like glyphosate. <clears throat> but if you wanna use a herbicide treatment, you wanna apply it to the rosettes, which is the, the leaves that grow in kind of in a circular pattern close to the ground in the first year of production. So that's gonna to have to be done either in the spring or the fall. And with all these things, you're gonna to wanna to keep the harvest and grazing restrictions in mind. Okay. So just some other tough weeds that you, know, you may be dealing with out there like bull thistle or Canada thistle. A lot of times in pasture, these are in the fence line so you have a couple options there you could mow. If you can get your mower under the, you know, if it's not a, a fence that you, where you can get a mower under there to mow them, or you could spot treat with something like glyphosate. But if they're spread out in the pasture, it's gonna be a lot more difficult. Um, so you can mow to suppress their growth. We'll try and, the problem with perennials is you're gonna get reproduction both from seed and underground roots that spread. You wanna pick a herbicide that you could apply ideally at the butter bloom stage towards the end of the season so that you have an advantage of uh, depleting the root reserves and winter on, on the heels of the spray to help take them out. <clears throat> the woody perennials, are gonna be kind of like the napweed. They're more difficult to control and they're gonna take multiple modes of control to finally eliminate them. Again, you can mow to suppress and prevent seed production. If it's, I've seen people go out with bulldozers to try and clean up bad multi-flora rose infestations. But again, any, piece of root that you leave in that field will generate a new plant. So you have to keep your eye out there and watch for those plants and maybe go out and spot spray with glyphosate or something when they, before they really get established. And if, if you do have a problem with like multiflora rose or some of the other woody perennials, there are some specific fact sheets that would be helpful. And if you need those, contact myself or Jeff or Mike. Another option with the multiflora rose is to do a basal bark application in the early spring. It would be like in March, you go out and paint, basically paint or spray on the base of the stems to uh, kill them. 
just use the recommended herbicides from those specific fact sheets. <clears throat> milkweed is, you know, we often get the question, how do I control milkweed or dog bane in my hay field? It is a tough plant to kill because it, it has the underground roots that spread. It's, it definitely sets off a lot of seeds from the flower. So if you do have a patch, you wanna try and control it as soon as you become aware of it because it'll just continue to expand in the field. So mowing can help. Again, mowing will help deplete root reserves, but uh, mowing with a fall applied herbicide is probably a little bit better in terms of getting it out maybe faster within a couple of years. Uh, yeah, once this once the plant spread, it just becomes more expensive and more more costly in terms of time and resources to try and get it under control. So we recommend a mixture of 2,4-D with Banville. So four pints of 2,4-D. And again, this is not the ester form formulation is 3.8 pounds per gallon with two pints of Banville or Clarity. And there's, for a lot of these biennials and perennials, that's what our, our mixes come down to is a mix of 2,4-D and Banville because there, se there seems to be some synergistic effect from the two chemicals together. They're both group four chemicals. They work in the same way, but when you combine them, they seem to do a better kill than either one alone. And again, it's kind of the same thing. Apply after weeds have reached the bud stage in mid to late summer before killing frost. You could, if you have this kind of equipment, any of these taller biennials and <clears throat> perennial weeds that are up above the harvestable crop, you could treat with a wipe on applicator, either a roller or the wick type applicators. And the Penn State guide really has uh, the best information on using those kind of applicators. There's a whole section uh, dedicated to explaining which ones work best and how to use them. So if that's something of interest, we can get you that specific information also. Glyphosate is an option, but with uh, glyphosate, you're gonna kill the underlying crop that you want. So that's gonna require reseeding. Uh, and I didn't want to leave out horse nettle. Horse nettle could be another weed that, um, you know, is kind of in this category of being really kind of pernicious and difficult to control. Okay, so here's, uh, you can see here we have summer annual broadleaf weeds, we have winter annual weeds, simple perennials, and they're all being controlled with 2,4-D and Banville at different rates. So <clears throat> the more difficult the weed is, the more of a perennial with difficult, a difficult root system, the higher the rates of the individual products. So pokeweed and curly dock um, are two huge nuisance, nuisance weeds. Don't really see pokeweed that often in hay and pasture, maybe on the edge of the field. So pokeweed, you could go out there with a shovel and try to dig that, that plant. And if there's only one or two, that's your best option. But that's got a tough root system. And uh, it, it could be as big as like two and a half, three inch diameter roots. Uh, you could also spot spray that with Roundup if it's limited. On the right, we have curly dock. Curly dock is a terrible plant to get in a, a new seeding field. Buterac is labeled for control. It takes a very high rate, like three quarts. And the plant has to be fairly small. So that's what makes it so difficult to control is that by the time the alfalfa is large enough to handle the buterac, the curly dock's usually bigger than I, the ideal size for control. And you can see that each plant there is setting a lot of seeds so it can really uh, spread and be a, a problem. This is a weed that was mentioned, the tall buttercup. 
We tend to see that in overgrazed horse pastures. It likes wetter ground. Um, personally, I feel like you could go in and kill this. And if you keep overgrazing and don't change your management practices, it's going to be right back where it was. And the thing about tall buttercup is I see it in every single horse pasture I go out to, to evaluate. It's supposedly pretty toxic to horses, but I, I don't think they, they mess with it. They can either smell or they take a bite. That's why it's such a pain in the butt because it flowers and it sticks around and it takes up space where something valuable could be growing. Um, but if the field, but I tend to see it in wetter spots that I think you could go through all the trouble of killing it and receding. And then I think you're gonna be right back in the same, same place just because it's a compromised growing area. So we have a few products available, Cimarron, 2,4-D, Crossbow. They'll all provide good control. Uh, and my notes say that Dicamba is less predictable in terms of control. You know, I'm running, I'm running uh, over here, but I'm, I'm almost done. So just some final thoughts why herbicide applications may fail. Maybe you're targeting a misidentified weed, so you chose the wrong herbicide. Timing of application. Um, drought and heat stress plants are more, plants are more difficult to control. It's harder for chemicals to get into them. They're just a little more resilient. Um, and then improper calibration or choice of adjuvants. Time your herbicides for when weeds are most susceptible. And I talked a lot about that and uh, try to choose the ones that are recommended and will be effective. Um, so I just wanted to share some resources quickly. So this is uh, from the agronomy guide. This is from the Penn State agronomy guide and it's a recommendation for um, post-emergence control in alfalfa with butyrac. And what I wanted to point out is that it has the rate of the product, but then it has all this additional information. So it tells you the size of the plants to apply it to, and it tells you the amount of the volume of water and uh, temperature restrictions and things like that. So there's just a lot of additional information. It would all be on the label, but this kind of just summarizes some of the key points. So that's a nice resource. Um, there's all these great tables. I think Mike showed some of these last week or Jeff did, where you have the weed species and then the effectiveness rating for different herbicide options. So that's, a that's an, an example from the Penn State guide. This one is from the Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois guide. So you have the weeds across the top and then the different options on the left bar and then the ratings in the table. So you can pick the most effective chemicals for your array of weeds. And then this is just a reminder that with hay crop and pasture, you have to stay aware of the grazing harvest and haying restrictions. <clears throat> And so there's tables that have all this summarized in some of these um, booklets. Again, similar, a similar table. And then the adjuvants. We want to make sure we're adding the right adjuvants to our product to get the most effective kill on our weeds that we can. So here's a nice table summarizing your adjuvant, adjuvant options for different herbicides. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you for your attention. And I can take some questions. So Janice, one of the questions that came out in the chat <clears throat> was uh, how much does uh, manure application to alfalfa fields contribute to weed intrusion? Well, I don't know if I have a good number for that, but your manure will have some viable weed seeds in it. and the nitrogen it's providing to the crop is going to feed any weeds that do germinate. So in one of these guides that I read, it said, do not apply 
manure to establish alfalfa. Well, we all know that most people need to apply manure to alfalfa because they don't have enough other ground to spread it on. So, and it does uh, provide, you know, an array of nutrients more than just N, P, and K. It has sulfur, um, which is really, you know, important in our cropping systems today. So it's kind of, it's kind of a trade-off and it goes kind of goes back to that, what's your tolerance question uh, in terms of weed, um, you know, the visible weeds in your field. I think a lot of folks will pour the manure on in the last couple of years of the stand because they know it's gonna be plowed up in a couple of years and it's gonna feed the crop that follows. So, <clears throat> Um, if you want a super clear, perfect stand, probably you don't want to put manure on in the maybe seeding year and following year. And in later years, maybe that's less of an issue and you're going to want the fertility it provides. So I don't think there's a, for me, there's not a hard and fast rule. I think there's uh, consequences, both positive and negative to applying it to a uh, alfalfa crop. If we're talking clear grass fields or pasture, pasture you're not going to put it on because animals won't want to graze, but you could do it in the late fall. You know, in a grass stand, you're going to want to put that manure on for inexpensive fertilizer. Thanks, Janice. I think that was the only question that we had. I just wanted to remind folks that are uh, pesticide applicators to Go back to the chat, put in your name and your uh, certification number. And for CCA folks, so we're going to be posting the, uh, the, the information for you in a second. There is a poll that we're going to ask you to uh, fill out before you leave. Jeff, I just want to say if anybody has a particular weed scenario that they that I didn't address today, if they wanted to send me an email, I'd be happy to get back to them with some kind of a recommendation. Thanks, Janice. And I, I also uh, promise that we'll be sending you a copy of this because Janice has shared her uh, presentation with me and uh, she has put together a list of resources that we'll send to you by email after the meeting. Also, too, to add uh, Janice on the multi flora rows, um, we can always use Cimarron Plus in in pasture pasture situations for it. It's got uh, it's got the active ingredient uh, metsulfuron methyl, which um, used to it's the active ingredient that was an ally. I don't know if we ever had ally registered here for use in New York State, but it was one that was used. Uh, uh, when I worked out of state 30 years ago, we used to use uh, that same active ingredient on multi-flora rows on, on pastures and it worked fantastic. So I wouldn't uh, hesitate trying to use Cimarron Plus here in New York State on multi-flora rows. Fortunately, we don't see it up here in the North Country. So It's rampant in the Southern tier. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. <laughs> 